Welcome back. Today we'll embark on the first of three units on fallacious reasoning. And what is a fallacy? It's simply a mistake in reasoning or a bad argument. But that doesn't mean it's ineffective. Far from it. Fallacies can be highly persuasive to those who don't think critically. We'll need to be able to identify them in the wild, both to avoid them in our own reasoning and to recognize them when others resort to them. Fallacies come in two basic flavors, formal and informal. A formal fallacy is simply an invalid deductive argument. Informal fallacies are a bit more slippery. They're arguments with mistakes in their content, or context, or even mode of delivery. Before we look at an example of a formal fallacy, let's recall the valid deductive rule of inference known as modus ponens. Here it is. Premise 1, if P, then Q. Premise 2, P, conclusion, therefore Q. Now, let's fill it in with some statements. Premise 1, if Tracy plays in the U.S. Open, then she is a gifted tennis player. Premise 2, Tracy plays in the U.S. Open. Conclusion, therefore, she is a gifted tennis player. This is a valid deductive argument. Now, let's look at an argument with a superficial resemblance to modus ponens, but with a critical difference. It's invalid, and hence formally fallacious. Here's the form. Premise 1, if P, then Q. Premise 2, Q. Conclusion, therefore, P. Fleshed out, it reads like this. Premise 1, if Tracy plays in the U.S. Open, then she's a gifted tennis player. Premise 2, Tracy is a gifted tennis player. Conclusion, therefore, she plays in the U.S. Open. Wait a minute. There's something wrong here. Just because Tracy is a gifted tennis player, that does not mean or does not entail that she plays in the U.S. Open. Indeed, very few gifted tennis players achieve that distinction. By the way, this formal fallacy is so notorious, it's earned a name for itself. It's known as affirmation of the consequent. Beware. We'll encounter more formal fallacies when we begin our units on propositional logic. For now, let's concentrate on informal fallacies, since they are just as infamous and far more plentiful. We'll begin with the class of informal fallacies known as fallacies of distraction, also known as fallacies of relevance. What they have in common is that they sidestep, avoid, or even ignore the real issue under discussion and instead use their premises to offer irrelevant reasons for their conclusions. Perhaps the most frequently abused method of distraction is the appeal to emotion, known in Latin as the argumentum ad populum, or argument addressed to the people. Although it has many variants, its core feature is the attempt to use human sentiment, be it anger, love, pity, resentment, vanity, whatever, to persuade an audience to accept a conclusion almost always in the absence of material evidence. The problem is that these emotions are mere distractions that subvert our attention from the real concerns at hand. But as most humans have learned, emotions are not a good basis for making rational decisions. Appeals to emotion are very common in advertising and politics and seem to reach their most potent expression when these two domains meet. Most political commercials are intended to produce sentiments sufficiently strong to get people to vote or act in a certain way. Here's an example. In this clip, what's the emotion that's being exploited and which party paid for the ad? The sponsor for this ad was the Republican National Committee, and it masterfully manipulates a primal human emotion, namely fear. In Latin, that's known as the argumentum ad metum, the appeal to fear. In the case of advertising, Appeals to emotion are aimed at evoking feelings that will persuade people to buy a specific brand or product. As in political advertising, these commercials are usually free of any real evidence. Here's an analysis of several Super Bowl ads that use overt appeals to emotion. 
time again to review the Super Bowl ads, a thing we do every year here at the Kelly School, a couple days after the game. And a couple things happened this year that we thought uh, probably made some sense to talk about. And number one, those rational ads, the one that lists all of the reasons why you should be buying a particular product, not working so well this year in terms of features, particularly with automotive and some of the other kind of categories. The ones that really were striking, the ones that really were striking the ball hard and doing well were the emotional ads. Um, you also kind of saw um, stories about the values uh, of those brands, the kinds of things that we as, as, as humans uh, really um, prioritize, the kinds of things that we've had the Super Bowl, this is a, the big American holiday. And so you see Chrysler talking about um, helping one another out and getting through tough times. You see the VW Beetle kind of talking about a, a universal uh, kind of uh, inclination to slim down and get better and, and be better and be something really new and fresh for the new year and that and that spot did really well for them and those tended to be huge the Chevy ad where we're talking about here's what we here's what we're going to get in our graduate for uh, for graduation not the fridge but the but the Camaro huge ad lots of humor in it and something that really uh, empty nesters and college kids both got a big kick out of uh, so the emotional ads really working for the companies this year. As you've seen, appeals to emotion can run the gamut of human feelings. To close, let's look at a particularly offensive appeal to pity that exploits our patriotic sentiments, bogus charities that claim to benefit veterans. These scammers use emotionally charged language, such as fallen hero, wounded warrior, or disabled veteran. While legitimate charities also use these terms, the scammers misuse the real plight of crippled veterans to get us to donate on social media or crowdfunding sites, not to mention spoofed phone calls that solicit by shaming us into giving money. Here's a video that exemplifies a typical appeal to pity devised by a widely discredited veterans charity that has soaked many millions from Americans using the appeal to pity. It's a wonderful thing, and we cannot do this without your donation. Our donors have been incredible. Uh, it's, we, we, we are very appreciative for, for all the money they give us because it allows us to really go out and work on their behalf and put that money to use and find the, 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 the programs or the, or the organizations that are helping veterans. And that money really, really becomes so much more effective when it goes into the community in a very thoughtful way. And I think our donors are just, they're the greatest because without them, we wouldn't have anything to, to do and we wouldn't have any veterans to help. And it's just that it, we're very, very appreciative for, for everything they do for us. I want to communicate to our donors on saying thank you. I'm the guy that wants to make sure our programs are serving as many as we can. Please visit our website, www.dvnf.org, and look at our impact reports. Look at our programs. Help a nonprofit organization fill in the gap that is needed to support and take care of our veterans in need and please donate.